Hello, everybody. Uh, I hope your first day at reInvent has been super interesting so far. Uh, first, let's check the session. This is STG206. We're going to talk about data resiliency design patterns with AWS. I'm Rajesh Vijay Raghavan. I'm a principal business development manager for AWS Storage. And I'm Jay Rolett. I'm a senior principal engineer with AWS File, Edge, and Data Services. Our customers want simple, fully managed uh, services that protect their data on the cloud. Uh, they're also focusing on application data resiliency and ensuring that they have business continuity. So today, we are going to talk what data resiliency is, why it matters for you, and how you can incorporate it into your application architecture. Data resiliency is a really broad topic, and AWS has so many tools in the toolbox that we wouldn't have time to cover all of those in this session. So this will be a high-level overview, a 200-level session, where we'll go through common data resiliency design patterns that we've noticed with our customer base. So Jay, uh, I really get confused between these terms, right? Data resiliency, high availability, disaster recovery. So can you explain what these are to the audience here? Yeah, sure, Josh. So data resiliency is the ability for your application to withstand partial and intermittent failures across your components and eventually recover from unexpected conditions. What customers expect today is for applications and services to be always on and to be reliable. They want to see high availability, right? Um, customers don't care about hardware failures in your data center. They don't care about the software upgrades you're doing to secure their data, unless, of course, you don't do that and their data gets exfiltrated, and then they suddenly care a whole lot. Um, <clears throat> and they don't care that it's you know, Cyber Monday and you're getting, your website's getting hammered by a 1,000 times the traffic that it normally does. This is all creating a need for highly distributed and sophisticated application architectures supported by distributed teams with pretty multi-dimensional skill sets. High availability is about preventing data loss, excuse me, preventing loss of service, not data loss. It's dealing with smaller scale but more frequent events like component failures, network issues, load spikes. And then sometimes it's about graceful degradation of your services rather than hard failures, right? Let's take video conferencing as an example, right? If the internet's having a bad hair day and your video quality starts taking a dive, as long as it stays there, even though it's going at a lower resolution, you're still able to have your meeting, right? I'm much happier about that. In a severe case, if video goes out completely, it might drop back to audio. So I'm really not happy about that, but I can continue my meeting and and the business decisions can be made. Ideally, what will happen is, is that once the network issues are resolved, video quality will dynamically adjust back to where you're going. So you have that graceful degradation there instead of hard failures. One of the tenets of good application design is to design for failure, right? As, our, as Amazon CTO Werner Vogel says, everything fails all the time. I want to say all the freaking time, but that's not what he says. So, um, Resilient applications provide continuous service despite disruptions. So the other side of data resiliency is disaster recovery, right? Disaster recovery is about recovering from loss of service. Any event that keeps your application performing its business objectives is a disaster. This would include natural disasters like hurricanes or earthquakes that flood a data center, right? Technical failures such as a loss of network connectivity or a site-wide power failure or more commonly human actions, right? Somebody accidentally misconfigures a router or somebody from the outside of your authorized user list comes in and modify the data. Now there's two key measures for data, <coughs> two key measures for data recovery. One is how long does it take me to become operational again, right? This is our RTO, recovery time objective. The second is how much data can we afford to lose? This is our RPO, recovery point objective. If I'm backing up my database every hour and all my database servers go away, right? I have an outage and it wipes them out. Um, then at most, I've lost one hour's worth of changes to my data set. That's my RPO. It's one hour. If it takes me four hours to reprovision my database servers, restore my backups to get back online, right? Then my RTO is four hours. So beyond the customer expectations around high availability, 
The business impact of data resilience is enormous. Right? IDC did a study in 2020 where they found that the annual application downtime cost was around 1.25 to 2.5 billion dollars. BCG did a similar study around the cost savings from investments into key data resilience architectures, and they found that they're saving 15 to 25 percent. These, do, these raw dollar figures keep growing year after year, right? Never mind the impact the outages have on your personal stress level when you're trying to run these as a service. So let's take a look at the impact of events versus their likelihood of failure. Unintentional human errors are by far one of the most common things that happen in here, right? It could be rebooting the wrong server, deploying the wrong version of software, deploying dependencies out of order, right? Um, the list is pretty much endless, unfortunately, uh, but lack of automation tends to be the primary root cause around these human operators' errors. Next up are load failures, load-based failures, right, where the amount of resources that you have is just not enough to keep up with your load. Um, as scale continues to grow, you get into some really interesting failure modes. Um, so for the, your SRE folks, that becomes a lot of fun. Then you get component host failure. Once again, at scale, what's going to happen is it ends up almost becoming like background radiation, right? It's just something that always happens, and, it keep, and it's, you can't get away from it. It becomes a, less of a rare event. In all these scenarios, right, the way to keep your application uptime up is designing for high availability, whether that's one of the, a human deploying something wrong or a full-on data center interruption. So Rajesh, why don't you take us through some of the, uh, the scarier modes on this? So there are other causes of uh, failure which are kind of rare, right? So uh, they could have severe impact to your operations. Think of the natural disasters that Jay talked about through a flooding or earthquake, right? Or large scale events that could potentially interrupt your service, right? So these are the areas where disaster recovery kicks in to provide data resilience. Uh, if you were to draw a line between uh, when to design for high availability versus when to design for disaster recovery, uh, it really depends on the criticality of your applications. For example, the blue line here is probably at the right point where you have some of your engineering teams uh, doing their day-to-day -day work. They shouldn't be idle due, due to a single data center issue, but the regional level outage is quite rare for them, right? So it is not really worth coming up with a multi-region design for them. On the other hand, let's take the case of uh, an airline scheduling system or a high-speed trading, right? So the business cost of going offline, even for a few minutes or even seconds, is too high. So in that case, you'll ideally go for an active-active or multi-region design for your data resilience pattern. Here, we would like to talk to you about the shared responsibility model for data resilience. So resiliency is a shared responsibility between AWS and the customer. Um, AWS is responsible for resiliency of the infrastructure that runs all our applications in the cloud. The infrastructure comprises of hardware, software, networking, facilities that run our AWS cloud services. As a customer, you're also responsible here. So you're responsible for the resiliency of your applications in the cloud. You assume the responsibility and management of the guest operating system, including updates and software patches, your application software, as well as the configuration of the AWS-provided security group firewall. Disaster recovery strategies, namely backup plans, data replication, data protection plans that we'll be covering through this presentation, come under your responsibility. And this shouldn't be done just by the storage administrator or the engineering team. The business teams and legal teams need to be also consulted with when you're setting these strategies. So to provide data resiliency, our design principle is to eliminate single points of failure in the underlying physical infrastructure. We have 30 regions worldwide, each with multiple availability zones. Each of our 96 availability zones are designed to operate independently and provide a fault isolation boundary. Namely, a fault in one AZ should never affect operations in another AZ within the region. So AZ independence is one of the foundations uh, to how we built a data resilient storage 
service infrastructure. So our regional storage services are resilient against AZ level outages and are highly durable. S3, DynamoDB, and even our Elastic file system, all of these services come with 11 nines of durability. They also feature resiliency capabilities, enhancing capabilities such as object versioning, replication, lifecycle management, snapshots, and real-time monitoring that can trigger event detection and response automation as warranted. Customers can also leverage AZ independence, similar to how we are doing for our services. So when you architect your applications to be multi-AZ or even multi-region, you are going to make it highly resilient. Now, we are part of the storage team. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, I'm a storage business development manager, and in my day-to-day -day job, I deal with several customer personas. And it's not a one-size-fits-all, but our team's goal is we need to provide the tools and capabilities to enable you to effectively protect your data and keep your applications resilient throughout the workflow, right? So AWS has the most complete data storage services, delivering object, file, and block storage services. Along with, if you look on the left-hand side, we have services such as AWS Backup, AWS Elastic Disaster Recovery, and we'll go through AWS Resilience Hub. These services are going to help you in your data protection and resiliency needs. So first, let's start with the customer persona, right? So in my job as a business development manager, I come across distinctly three types of customer persona. So uh, there is the customer that is still predominantly on-prem. Uh, they have their primary data on uh, storage arrays, such as Hitachi or NetApp or Dell EMC. And they want to first dip their toes into the cloud by taking some of their secondary data, some of their backups, and moving it to the cloud, right? Uh, and then we, see, we also see the next set of customers, that's the hybrid customer, wherein they have maybe half of their applications, mission-critical applications, still on-premises. Think of the mainframe use cases and such. But still, some of these customers are deploying their DevOps or other applications in the cloud, right? So they have a hybrid need sharing the data between on-premises and the cloud. And then the third set of customers we come across uh, often nowadays, think of the startups. These are the digitally native customers. So they don't have any on-prem infrastructure. They design their applications and workloads with the cloud in mind. Lastly, uh, we are also going to look at the uh, business continuity and disaster recovery, which is you know, top of mind for all these three customer personas. So as I mentioned, let's first look into the on-premises uh, backup use case and what are their requirements and how they go about it. So in this architecture that you see on the left, you have the typical on-prem applications. There are backup uh, clients. There's a backup server. Customers have been doing this for several decades now. Um, so in this use case, the, as I mentioned, uh, the easiest way for our customers to start enjoying AWS cloud services is moving their backup to the cloud. Customers can either use uh, native storage products such as Storage Gateway, uh, that, that can present itself as a file storage target, or a nice SCSI volume when you use the volume gateway for the on-prem application to move data to the cloud. On the backend, these gateways use the S3 APIs that move the data over to S3 or Glacier or different classes of S3 and Glacier. Customers can also continue to use their existing investments. What we mean by that is uh, several customers that I deal with, they already work with Commvault or Veritas or Rubik, any of these backup vendors. Practically every enterprise backup software out there, it's integrated with S3, so they can point their APIs to S3 and Glacier and move that data. Now, similar use case, but if you see here in this design pattern, Customers are still deploying tapes. Would you believe that the LTO tape vendors are still selling tons of tape to enterprise customers? What we are seeing is on the left, uh, customers are still using their backup servers. They are taking their backups on tapes, moving it to a, you know, a bunker service just for air gap uh, protection. But uh, with the storage gateway, again, we can uh, use the storage gateway, and uh, instead of using a physical tape library, the, the target now becomes a virtual tape gateway. And then 
Uh, similar to the previous use case, customers can point that data to the cloud. And what this uh, enables is for, they no longer have to purchase tapes and you know, uh, physically load it, unload the tape drive. And most of the times, they are not even able to retrieve this data from tapes on time. right? So definitely moving to the cloud for tape backup helps. The next persona is the hybrid persona. So um, as I mentioned, these are customers that have workloads on premises. Let's take the use case of a hybrid storage with Amazon FSx for NetApp on tap. So it's a managed file service, which we have partnered with partner NetApp. Uh, let's say customers have NetApp on-prem filers, and they are looking for a hybrid storage solution in the cloud. Uh, with the FSx for NetApp on tap solution, customers can now do what is called cloud bursting. Let's say data is located on premises. They can, they can be cached remotely with FSx for NetApp on tap using a feature called Flex Cache. An example of this uh, use case would be an EDA, electronic design automation company. Let's say they have data stored on prem on these filers in Austin, and let's say their remote users are in Singapore that need low latency access to this data. By utilizing Flex Cache on the on prem NetApp instance, and FSx for ONTAP instance in Singapore, the uh, ONTAP instance in Singapore will start caching the elements of the tools library, and the Singapore-based users can now access. This will result in very low latencies instead of going through a round trip to Austin. Customers could do also, uh, also do the opposite, which is on-prem caching, right? So think of this as the inverse of cloud <coughs> bursting. In this model, the tool library actually resides in the FSx for ONTAP instance. And customers that require a cache copy on on-prem in the data center, which could be anywhere in the world, again, Flex Cache can uh, help in this need, right? So NetApp also has another feature called Global File Cache that, that can support SMB file caching. <clears throat> One of the key attributes of data resiliency is the ability to have the data at the scale wherever you need it and whenever you need it. So in some hybrid cases where you have on-prem equipment generating large amount of data, you may want to use that data, you may want to use the scalability and elasticity of the cloud for that data. So again, you will use cloud bursting for this model. Let us take the case of an on-prem customer who has NFS servers, Let's say they are generating a lot of data. Uh, let's say it's a genomics or a DNA sequencing customer. And they are pushing that data from, uh, to an on-prem file system, NFS file system. They probably also have their research partners pushing their data as well directly to S3. Now, they're going to do some of their processing of the data on-prem, but they really like the elasticity of the cloud. And maybe they want to do some machine learning training using SageMaker on the genomics data, right? So in this use case, we have a feature called Amazon File Cache that will uh, essentially hide the latency and you know, the bandwidth between the on-prem and AWS cloud. So File Cache is a fully managed, high-speed distributed cache that helps in cloud bursting workloads in this hybrid scenario. Once it's processed in the cloud uh, using ML tools, we can again use file cache to push the model output to S3, where, again, the research partners could uh, use this data to do further analysis. So now let's look at the third persona, which is the digitally native customer, and what are their key requirements and use cases. From a resiliency point of view, this use case is about operating your applications at scale and ensuring availability of your data. Uh, so if you look at this architecture, this is essentially a customer trying to recreate their traditional three-tier three on-prem architecture. So they got their elastic load balancing across three availability zones. They have their EC2 uh, scaling group that provisions new instances as load increases. It will also be able to scale down the load as the load decreases. So this is a uh, cost-effective solution for cloud users because you pay, uh, you pay as you go. Next is their database layer. So Amazon's relational database, RDS, is similar to how you would do on-prem. There is a primary instance where all the updates to the database go to. When the database is updated later, it replicates those changes to the replicas in other availability zones. 
If the availability zone that the primary data is in goes down for whatever reason, then an election takes place and one of the replica takes over for, uh, as the primary. One way to increase your availability and durability uh, of your data layer is by using one of our regional services. We already spoke about S3, DynamoDB, and EFS. These services automatically replicate data and compute across multiple availability zones. S3 is our durable, highly available object store. DynamoDB is our fast and flexible non-relational database service and EFS is our elastic file storage. All these three services are designed to provide 11 nines of durability. Another key element that the digitally native customers use is the serverless approach. So with serverless approach, we typically say it's data resiliency in an easy mode. So serverless architecture uh, is more than just compute. We have customers that just think of it as uh, using AWS Lambda or Fargate, but uh, with serverless, we are also able to utilize it in the other layers, namely the data stores layers and integration. We'll go into that. With the serverless approach, you're actually able to push the lines of shared responsibility more to the AWS side. You're able to pay as you go for utilizing whichever service you like. So the architecture for the digitally native customers typically uses services like uh, you'll have an API gateway to provide an interface to your applications. Your DynamoDB is there for low latency, web scale, no SQL storage. S3 will be there for durable long-term object storage. EFS again comes in for elastic file storage. And for very complex workflows, we can even orchestrate those using step functions. So serverless approach lends itself well for event-based architectures. So event notification queues are also important in managing data across your applications. So it's really when all of these components come together that we really start seeing a resilient architecture for our DNB customers. With serverless architecture, multi-AZ comes along with it. So as we discussed in the prior slide, the regional services come with high availability and fault tolerance. The multi-regional services are responsible for scaling, their, scaling up your applications or scaling down. They're even able to perform health checks and even manage failures. Now, when we start talking about multi-region, we, we need to look into some of the design considerations for multi-region customers. As enterprise designed for cloud, they carry the same requirements as they, when they did on-prem. So including the need to replicate the data to multiple sites for compliance purposes. So in late 2021, we expanded what is called our access points and launched multi-region access points for S3. It's a single global uh, endpoint in front of multiple buckets. It is able to automatically route over the network to the closest copy of your data and it, it has been able to accelerate multi-region applications by up to 60%. In the middle, we have our FSx for NetApp ONTAP service that provides robust replication capabilities spanning both on-premises and AWS. We also have our Elastic File System re replication capability wherein you can keep an up-to-date copy of your EFS file system in a second AWS region or replicate it within the same region within minutes. Along with these, we also have our S3 replication capability, which is going to be very useful for your disaster recovery purposes. You can either do a same region replication or a cross region replication within minutes. And if something happens to your primary data in the primary region, then you can probably get back the data from the replicated region. You can even use different S3 classes of storage for cost savings as well on the replicated region. When talking, talking about regional designs, we need to cons consider some of the challenges that come with it. So have you wondered what happens to your application uh, when you cannot have any downtime, even after you have uh, come up with a multi-region architecture? There may be a lot of benefits from the multi-region architecture, like performance resiliency, but building applications on top of this multi-region storage has been very challenging. It has required custom regional logic that routes requests to the closest bucket. 
And if you implement more advanced traffic management, such as failover or latency-based routing, the logic becomes even more complex. This is where we have S3 multi-region access points, which is a key feature for our customers to consider deploying. It's a new, unique global host name to access buckets in multiple regions. Applications operate across multiple AWS regions without any code changes. Requests are accelerated and routed to the bucket with the lowest latency automatically. So we'll see an animation here. So there's a first red object written and replicated. Uh, it's read by user in Asia. Then we are going to see where m many red objects start coming in, right? So you'll see this, this becoming a complicated uh, pattern, right? Uh, let's say there are also LO objects now starting to flow in, right? Uh, it's going to start making you look dizzy here. So now let's look at the purple objects also coming in, right? So uh, these objects are seamlessly routed to the bucket with the lowest latency. That's multi-region access points for you. I'm now going to hand it over to Jay to talk about the business continuity and disaster recovery design patterns, which is top of mind for all these three uh, personas that we discussed. All right, got to get that slide off there before I get dizzy walking up here. All right, so as Rajesh talked about, we're going to talk now about kind of the business continuity and disaster recovery, the second half of that slide when we talked about what constitutes data resiliency. We're going to talk about some design patterns and some disaster recovery strategies based on you having different business requirements for individual applications. Okay. Disaster recovery strategies kind of can be cl generally classified in four different approaches with AWS, each with a different balance between cost, implementation and operational complexity, protection and recovery time. So starting on the left, we have backup and restore as kind of one of our first of our active passive strategies. With backup and restore, you've got low cost protection for your data. But in the event of a disaster, it may take hours or even days to restore your data and get back up and going. It's cheap, and it may be for a non-critical application, it may be the right strategy. I'm going to hop over to Warm Standby now. Um, Warm Standby is very similar to traditional on-premises disaster recovery. You have a secondary copy of your application provisioned in a different location that's in, running in passive mode. Data is replicated from the active region, the active location, to the standby. Um, generally, it's done periodically, but it depends on, it could be done continuously depending on what your RPO is and what sort of data loss you can deal with. The standby site's always running, but it's not fully scaled up, so it's a little cheaper to run and operate. In the event of a disaster, you can fail over, scale up, and make your warm standby the active instance. So warm standby provides a good balance between minimal recovery time for your business critical apps and costs. I'm going to go back to Pilot Light now. Pilot Light's essentially a cost-optimized version of Warm Standby that's really kind of unique to the cloud. Um, the data is still replicated, just like it is for Warm Standby. Um, the difference is that your second location is only partially provisioned, right? So before you can fail over, now I need to spin up instances of my application and get it running, scale it out, and then I can get going again. Recovery time goes from minutes with warm standby to more tens of minutes with the pilot light strategy, but you get a significant cost savings with that. And then finally, you get your mission critical applications where you can't afford any downtime. Right? You would employ a multi-site active-active strategy. Your application is running live in multiple regions, and traffic is being load balanced across them based on load. Traffic is being directed across them based on load and or latency. If there's a disaster and one site goes offline, the other site might have to dynamically scale up, but either way, you've got no outages for your business. Um, ultimately, which disaster recovery strategy you use should be decided based on your business continuity requirements, and, and also, depending on what uh, vertical you're in, possibly regulatory or compliance requirements. Okay, so let's take a look at our first design pattern. Right? For disaster recovery, we're going to look at backup and restore. Here we've got a simple application running in one AZ. Right? We've got, I've got an EC2 instance with my application running on it, and I've got three different forms of storage available to it. I've got an EBS volume, I've got an EFS file system, and then I have an RDS instance running all in my AZ. So to back those up for disaster recovery, right, for the EBS volume, I may be using EBS snapshots and storing those in an S3 bucket. 
For my EC2 instance and my EFS file system, I'm going to be using AWS backup to move the data, protect the data inside of a backup vault. For the RDS instance, I'm going to be doing database snapshots, again, storing them in an S3 bucket. Um, and then I could also have the option of storing, I'm pushing my transaction logs to an S3 bucket so that if I need to do point in time restore, I've got the ability to restore down to an individual transaction. Now, ideally, when you're doing all this, you're managing it from AWS backup so that you've got one place to write your policy for how, what should be backed up for different types of resources and manage it from a single pane. Okay, lovely. There's a flood. My AZ's gone where my application was running. Um, now, my EFS file system is still up and running because it's still available because it's a regional data storage service and it's designed to be resilient to AZ level failures, but the rest of my application is down. So how do we get it back up? Well, with a backup and restore strategy, what we do is we restore all of our different resources into a different availability zone in the same region, okay? Um, not too bad. If I wanted to do this now into another region, it really kind of looks very similar. The difference is that there's one more thing I need to set up uh, before my disaster hits, and that's I need to do cross-region replication of my S3 bucket and my EFS file system to the backup region. Right? Once I've got my data restored there, let's see, once I've got my data copied over there, if I need to fail over, I can restore it into the new region, right? And it may take some time to deploy and restore our resources, but we had really cost-effective protection from data loss. Okay, next up is our pilot light strategy, which provides really a great balance between cost recovery and recovery time. So starting from the top, we've got Amazon Route 53. We're going to use Route 53 basically to direct all of the clients towards whichever region is our active region. At the top of each region, we've got an elastic load balancer. Both routes, whether it's my uh, standby or my active, are going to go to my load balancer. Behind the load balancer, we have a traditional client server architecture uh, in this diagram, but honestly, it could be any application stack in the back end. This is just what we're using as an example here. Now, the load balancer is going to distribute requests across different AZs and across different server instances to load balance it for high availability. These instances are in auto-scaling groups to allow our application to scale up or scale down based on the load. Then on the back end, we've got RDS, our SQL database. Primary instance is in one AZ. Right? And that's the one that all of our application servers are going to be talking to when they're doing updates. They're going to talk to it. And it's replicating to another AZ to a standby replica in case we have a failover event. Okay, so far so good. Our architecture is both highly available and it's scalable. But for data resilience, we also want the ability to handle a region-wide outage for data recovery. So the right side is our DR region. The database read replica down at the bottom there is our pilot light, if you will, of our data, of our data recovery region. We're using cross-region replication to keep the DR database up to date with the primary with a few seconds, within a few seconds or minutes of when the action happens in the primary. <clears throat> Besides the database, um, then what else do you need to configure in your DR region? Right? Because the whole point of Pilot Light is you want to keep things caught, you want to keep things cheap by not running everything. So you have to set up your VPC. You've got to set up your network subnets. You have to set up your elastic load balancer. And you're going to set up your auto scaling groups. But you're going to configure them to run zero instances because we don't want to run it there. That's where our big cost savings comes from. Whoops. Jumped one far too ahead. Um, so with, the, with notice that the EC2 instances aren't running there, um, with the, the auto scaling groups are basically going to be configured to run zero instances. If the event that there's a outage right in our active region, what do we need to do to activate this DR region? Right? How, how hard is that to make it bring it online? Um, so the first thing we're going to do is we're going to promote that read replica in the DR region to be primary. Right? So now it's one that can be written to. Um, we're going to update the configuration of our auto scaling groups to make sure that, to set them so that they're going to spin up those EC2 instances to handle our load and run our application. 
And finally, in Route 53, we're going to update the route weights to send clients over to the DR region now instead of the previous active region. That's it. You've activated your DR region in a matter of minutes, not hours. Okay, one more pilot light design pattern here. Um, this time we're going to take a look at a hybrid scenario where customers running in an on-prem data center and they're using AWS as their DR site. We're going to use, this time we're going to use Elastic Disaster Recovery, um, which makes this scenario super easy and cost effective. So in your on-prem data center, we're going to install a replication agent on your on-prem servers. After that, once you've got those replication agents on there, they're going to continuously do block level replication, which is compressed and encrypted for security, up to your VPCs to into a staging area in region. Okay? Um, these are going to, DR, DRS, Elastic Disaster Recovery, is going to, they're going to provision low cost EC2 instances to, be, to receive that data and store it in there in case, of, in case you need to do a failover. Now, much like our other pilot light design pattern, there's no application servers idling in the cloud when you're not having a disaster event. Right? If there is a disaster event, you'd initiate a failover from DRS console. DRS is automatically then going to provision all of your resources to get your application back online in minutes. Now, we've talked about DRS here in, our, in this hybrid mode where we're going between a data center and in the cloud. You can also use DRS between regions and between availability zones inside of AWS. So even if you're running fully in the cloud, you can use DRS for that as well. Click. Okay, so one of the things that we just got through launching for reInvent this year with DRS is the ability to do auto failbacks so if you're in the cloud and you're running using DRS to provide failover from one region to another or from an AZ to another, um, you're able to go into the console and automatically fail it back without having to do any downtime. And it's going to take multiple EC2 instances back to the original region, and that can all be operated with the, the DRS console. Now, the part about that that I'm most excited about is the fact that the rep is that the, this ability to perform non-disruptive disaster recovery drills and recovery. Right? DRS is running a bidirectional replication protocol here, so I can actually go in in my live system, do a failover with no events to my DR region, prove to myself that it works, and then I can fail it back to production without any data loss. That's a fantastic and powerful ability. There's nothing quite like knowing your DR really, really works because you've tested it live in production. Okay, let's take a look at warm standby design pattern now. Um, you'll notice it looks really similar to our pilot light design pattern. Um, in fact, the only real difference here is that instead of having none of our application servers running, we've got one of them each in our active, we have one each active. By having our application stack already running, we're able to fail over to our alternate region more quickly. We still need to promote the database to primary, just like we did before, and we still have to tell Route 53, hey, this new region is now the active region. Um, but there's no more waiting for our application to launch. Now, after we've got our self back online, right, then we're going to have to adjust the auto scaling groups to spin up enough instances to handle the full load from a performance perspective. Um, but you've got much faster RTO. The choice between pilot light and warm standby really comes down to whether or not you need an RTO of minutes or tens of minutes to justify the extra expense. Okay, and then when you have the big ones where your business absolutely can't afford any, down, any downtime, no data loss, then we're talking about a multi-region active, active architecture. We're going to stick mostly with the same architecture we've used before, but there's a few changes we've done to ensure maximum data resiliency. So first, with Route 53 at the top, notice that both sides of this are active. It's going to be directing clients to both regions full time. And then our auto scaling groups are turned all the way up in both regions. So we're not sitting around with things scaled down. And then finally, down at the bottom, you can see with DynamoDB, we've switched, sorry, we switched from using RDS to using DynamoDB as our data storage. Um, because DynamoDB with global tables syncing across both regions is going to provide, and that's propagating within a second typically, 
um, DynamoDB's regional service, like Rajesh mentioned earlier. And so it protects us both from AZ level outages and from region-wide events. Your application will have to make some choices about whether to write locally and deal with contention, right? So that's faster. Um, you get a little more complexity, or writing globally and dealing with higher latency. Um, so active-active multi-region designs like this do provide the highest data resilience, but there's a significant cost and complexity that comes along with it. Okay, let's take a look at a serverless application for disaster recovery. So just like we did in the pilot light and warm standby design patterns, we've got Route 53 at the top directing clients at our active region. So uh, essentially what happens is a request comes in and it's gonna go to our API gateway and then the API gateway is going to spin up a bunch of parallel Lambda instances, functions running. Each one is processing a single request independent of all the others that are running. So these scale up dynamically to your load. Then we've got, um, then in the, we're using DynamoDB with global tables again to sync to our standby region. Um, notice that there's no Lambda instances running in our standby region. Um, because we haven't sent any requests over that way. Um, so if we send one over there because we want to do testing, or if we're doing a failover event, it'll automatically spin up those instances for us. In this configuration, it really acts like the, our pilot light design pattern, except for serverless, right? Um, now, if we wanted to make this look like warm standby, we could provision capacity of our Lambda function so there's always ones running. Um, now, the difference between the warm standby and pilot light for a serverless architecture is much smaller, both in terms of RTO and cost, um, because you're just talking smaller units there. If there's a disaster that comes along and we can fail over from our primary region by updating the weights in Route 53 to direct clients and all the traffic requests over to our standby region. Now what's kind of cool, with the same exact architecture, just by changing the Route 53 configuration, we can make this run active-active. Right? We can configure equal weights for both of our regions, let them be both live with really no data changes. Um, it's significantly less complexity than a non-serverless approach. Um, yeah, that, I think Rajesh mentioned earlier, we really believe strongly that uh, serverless is easy mode for data resiliency. Okay, so we've looked at common design patterns for data resilience across kind of that full spectrum. Um, but I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about the importance of data protection, no matter what sort of data disaster recovery strategy you choose, right? Um, replication protects you from some forms of data loss, but it can't protect you against software that's ma writing malformed data. It can't protect you against the user that accidentally deletes a bunch, one of your database tables or one of your files. And it doesn't protect you from malicious actors modifying data behind you. Um, so this design pattern is really providing a recovery path from ransomware. So if you aren't familiar with ransomware, it's where malware gets into your network, it seeks out all of your data, and then starts encrypting it, right? After it encrypts your data, then it's basically going to demand payment, usually in some form of cryptocurrency like Bitcoin, for the keys to decrypt your data. These sort of events have taken out government offices, they've taken out hospitals, taking out gas pipelines, so national infrastructure. Um, they aren't very selective. And by not very selective, I mean they aren't selective at all, and they don't discriminate. Um, for companies that are desperate enough to get back online to pay the ransom, a lot of times what they find is that it actually takes longer to decrypt the data after they've gotten the key. So they go get out, do all the things to set up and be able to pay the crypto ransom. And then it just takes too long to, to decrypt everything and get their data back up. And so what they end up doing is just restoring from backup in the first place. Um, some painful lessons on that. So how do we protect against this and ensure we can recover our data? Okay. In our production account, we're going to set up a backup vault with appropriate backup plans to protect your data. Your workloads in AWS are going to be generating data, and then we're going to be taking those recovery points and storing them in the backup vault. So pretty normal stuff. Here's the, here's the interesting part. We're gonna set up a completely independent account. We're gonna call this our data bunker account. And the idea behind a data, data bunker account is it's not attached to the 
uh, authorizations and permissions that you have for your production account. Um, on the backup vault in our data bunker account, though, what we're going to do is we're going to enable a feature called Vault Lock, and we're going to set it to compliance mode. In compliance mode, our backups are immutable. It doesn't matter who you are. You can be the root user, and you can't delete or modify the backups on a compliance mode backup vault. So it's really kind of the ultimate protection there against ransomware. Um, OK, so the next thing we do, we need to get the data into there. So we're going to update our backup vault in our production account and have it push copy over the RPOs into the data bunker backup vault. And then we can use things like AWS Backup Audit Manager with the audit reports to make sure that we're following our compliance, following all of our compliance and report regulatory needs for this. So in the event that a ransomware attack comes and you actually need to deploy this to recover it, we're going it can be hard to figure out all the hijinks that somebody's done in your production account when they get in. Um, so best practice there is not try, to un not try to unroll all of that, but to create a brand new recovery account, set up a backup vault in there, and then we're going to push the data from our secure data bunker account into the recovery account. Once that's done copying, then we can start recording, restoring our application and getting back up online. Now, this isn't a zero data loss scenario um, based on what your RPO is, but the priority here is guaranteeing that you can get your business back online um, in a reasonable amount of time. So besides this, uh, the data bunker design pattern, AWS has a bunch of other services here to help you with protecting, assessing, monitoring, and alerting you to critical events like ransomware. So I'm going to hand this back over to Rajesh now to talk about some other things you should be considering in your data resilience journey. Thank you, Jay. I guarantee no more design patterns. We're, we're just going to bring it all back together here. So um, I want to talk to you about our well-architected framework where customers can learn, measure, and improve the resiliency of your workloads. There are five main pillars here, operational excellence, security, reliability, performance efficiency, and cost optimization. With the operational excellence pillar, we are essentially externalizing the culture that we have built within Amazon for our infrastructure. With security, security is job zero for AWS, and that's essentially what the pillar goes through. Reliability pillar essentially goes through all the things that Jay and I talked to you about high availability and DR strategies. Performance pillar is not about just being the fastest. This is also about performance to meet your business needs and how to achieve that most efficiently. Cost optimization pillar, again, is not being the cheapest. We are trying to get you the best value for what you're spending on AWS. By incorporating these pillars, uh, you, it will help you produce stable and efficient, uh, resilient architecture for your workloads. Now, it's one thing to design for resiliency, but uh, how do you know that it actually works? The only way for you to really know is to test it. Make sure that it scales. Make sure that it's able to fail over uh, AZs or across regions, right? So um, if you're taking backups, and let's say you're never testing your restore RPO or RTO SLAs, then you're essentially wasting your money. So you, you would eventually have to create run books and continually test if the mechanism is working properly. You need to test the recovery procedures with full application workload on it. So one of the services that we have is the AWS Resilience Hub. It's an application resilience service that provides customers a central place to define, validate, and track all the resiliency of your applications. So here is a quick walkthrough of the steps you will take in the Resiliency Hub. Step one is uh, first you import your infrastructure as code. You can do it either through cloud formation or you can even use a service catalog, app registry, or even AWS resource groups. Whichever way you choose, the first step is to bring the application to the Resilience Hub. The second step is to create a resilience policy. You're going to define the targets, RPO, RTO, for this application. And then on the third step, we are going to run an assessment. Uh, we will query your resources, understand your configurations, and provide an assessment as to whether we think you can meet your SLA, RPO, RTO targets. As an example, let's say you have a single availability zone RDS instance, and you have a backup for it, but you're not multi-AZ. 
If you want to understand your resilience for, this, for an AZ disruption, we're going to tell you by running this analysis that it won't meet your objectives, right? Let's say you have a very low RTO. And then we are also going to tell you how you can recover. So we'll say you, you can recover from a backup, but it won't be as quick as how you want to be, right? Finally, we are going to make some configuration recommendations. We're going to say maybe it's good for you to go multi-AZ RDS, right? We'll also make some operational recommendations, such as using CloudWatch alarms, uh, standard operating procedures to test your recovery. Step four is where you will go ahead and implement some or all of the recommendations from the Resilience Hub. And then we have something called the Fault Injection Simulator. This is actually going to run some experiments to test the resilience, right? So once you have integrated it into your CI CD pipeline, any new software release, this will be continuously checked and we will uh, report your resiliency posture. Last step is there is a dashboard that you can, uh, there is a resiliency score that is computed and you can keep uh, improving your posture. So the five key uh, areas for Resilience Hub are protecting your data and applications, defining the resiliency of your applications, testing to improve the resilience, and then you would, you would have to receive alerts and conduct readiness checks. Lastly, there should be the ability to restore data and applications. There are several services that are going into these different uh, phases. You'll notice that from storage, we have the AWS backup and the Elastic Disaster Recovery that is there to protect as well as recover your data. Let's talk about chaos engineering. So it's the process of stressing an application by artificially creating disruptive events. You, you can then observe how the system responds and implement some improvements. These could be as simple as powering down an instance, scaling up or scaling down an EC2 instance. You could add a firewall rule to block all access to a particular AZ. You can see how your application responds to an AZ level failure without actually uh, waiting for an AZ to fail. This could all be done mechanically, but what if you wanted a tool to help you simulate these events, right? That's where the AWS Fault Injection Simulator comes in. You can stress the application, observe how it behaves, and then improve the resilience and performance. Lastly, as we wrap up, one thing we want you to bear in mind is data resiliency is just not a technical problem. It's something that the entire organization, your people and processes should also be actively engaged in defining it. Just like how we can choose chaos engineering to test our application resiliency uh, and also our infrastructure high availability, game days are a useful concept to make sure your people and processes are also following it. Let's say a database goes down and you would want to understand how your on-call support or SRE engineers are reacting to it. What are the processes that they are following? Are there run books that are defined? Are they sufficient? Uh, are they, uh, do you have sufficient observability and monitoring to diagnose the key issues, right? So uh, it's a full simulation of an event, including people, processes, and technology. Here's how you would do it. You would assemble a cross-discipline game team with assigned roles for each. You plan a situation simulating a disaster that could be even small experiments. Or you can go through a full uh, disaster scenario where multiple components fail at the same time. When you run these experiments, you need to have observers available to see how long it takes to page someone. How fast can they react and address the issue, right? Uh, are there, again, run books and documentations that are sufficient to deal with this scenario? So there's all sorts of data that you can collect and you can again improve the resiliency of your applications. So again, we are at the end of this session, but we'd like to point you to other sessions related to data protection and application resiliency that you could attend this week. Some of these are uh, 300 level sessions that will go into much more details. There are also links to some really good white papers and resources that you could go uh, to understand more about the architecture here. Finally, we'd like for all of you to continue the learning with all these AWS resources. We have the AWS Skill Builder portal, as well as the ramp up guides to build on your storage knowledge. We also want you to check on the AWS storage badges that are great to showcase your knowledge, and you, know, you can show that you understand the storage concepts here. Visit the AWS training link as well to learn more about the AWS storage and data resiliency. 
Thank you so much for attending this session on a Monday afternoon. So hope you have a uh, rest of the week, great sessions this week. So we'll be, Jay and I will be available outside the room in case you have any questions. Thanks again. Feel free to uh, fill the survey. Uh, that's going to be very useful for feedback for us. So thank you again.